Last time on the history of Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by the Umayyad Caliphate, who by the mid-8th century weren't exactly having a good time. First they had to deal with the Berbers revolting, causing them to lose most of their territory in northwest Africa, and later they were overthrown by the Abbasids, who took over the Caliphate by 750. To tie up loose ends, the Abbasids decided to put the remaining Umayyads into a let's say early retirement, but one Umayyad prince, the young Al-Rahman, managed to escape the retirement home and resettled in Al-Andalus. The Basset Caliph was so impressed by Al-Rahman managing to survive that he gave him the title of the Falcon of the Quraysh, and by 756 Al-Rahman established the Emirate of Cordoba. Despite the Emirate basically existing out of sheer spite against the Abbasids, the Emirs would nominally recognize the Abbasids as the religious leaders of the community. But that didn't stop Cordoba from having political ambitions and to restore Umayyad rule, especially in northern Africa. But for now, Cordoba had to deal with domestic issues. You see, this area here, called the Upper March, which included the cities of Barcelona and Zaragoza, were ruled by pro Abbasid governors, who in 774 revolted against Cordoba. Al Rahman sent an army to quash the rebellion, so in response, the Wali of Barcelona decided to ask for help from the Franks, aka Charlemagne. The Franks at this point had already established diplomatic ties with the Abbasids, since they both opposed the Umayyad led emirate. However, the rebels managed to defeat defeat Al-Rahman's army before the Franks arrived. So when Charlemagne arrived at Zaragoza, they awkwardly told the Franks, um, actually, we don't need you anymore, so can you go now? But Charlemagne was like, nuh -uh, and tried and failed to take over the city. While on their way out, the Franks went through Basque territory. Since the 7th century, the Vascons, or Basques, had been part of the Frankish domain, but more or less acted independently and tended to rebel. So Charlemagne came with the big brain idea to destroy the walls of Pamplona. So in case if the Basques rebelled, they couldn't hide behind them. As you can imagine, the Basques weren't exactly happy having their city walls destroyed. So while the Franks crossed the Pyrenees, they ambushed them at the Battle of Roncevaux Pass. Charlemagne managed to survive, but the Basques did manage to kill Roland and the entire rear guard. In the end, Cordoba managed to defeat the rebellious governors, but this wouldn't be the last time that the upper march would cause trouble. By around 785, Al Rahman ordered the construction of the Mosque of Cordoba, which was and still is one of the most remarkable buildings from Al Andalus, with its most distinct features being the striped arches and horseshoe shaped gates. But Cordoba wasn't only accomplished in architecture. Al Rahman's successors would send emissaries to the Byzantines and Abbasids who would collect and bring back various books about medicine, theology, science, and much more. Though, despite how pretty it is, it's important to remember that Cordoba wasn't a flawless utopia. Political power was predominantly on the hands of the Muslim Arab elites, with Amazigh Muslims coming second, followed by Muladis, Mozarabs, and Jews. Non-Muslims were given the status of dimi, or protected person, and had to pay a tax called a jizya, but were allowed to practice their own religion. Despite that, this level of religious and cultural tolerance made Al-Andalus still quite exceptional. In its early years, years, the majority of the inhabitants spoke Andalusi Romance, a collection of vernacular Latin tongues which would be replaced by Arabic. But even the Arabic language began to evolve into its own distinct form, also known as Andalusi Arabic. Meanwhile, during the reign of Alfonso II, the supposed bones of Saint James the Great were found in Galicia and were held in Compostela, which would later become known as Santiago de Compostela. The city became a popular pilgrimage site and many pilgrims would often pick a scallop shell and take it back home to show that they accomplished their pilgrimage. The scallop became a symbol typically associated with Saint James. Alfonso also managed to gain recognition from Charlemagne and the Pope, making this the first time the Kingdom of Asturias was recognized by the Church and other Christian kingdoms. A few years prior, the Franks had created a buffer zone called the Spanish March between them and Cordoba, which is where the counties of Barcelona and Aragon would later emerge from. Meanwhile, the Basques in Pamplona were divided between pro-Frankish and pro-Cordoban factions. By 806, the Franks retook the city after it briefly came under Cordoban rule. However, after the defeat of the pro 
Frankish faction by the pro cordoban one, an anti-Frankish leader named Inigo Arista rose to prominence and in 820 took advantage of the political instability plaguing the Frankish kingdom, revolted and with the help of a powerful Muladi family defeated the Franks at the Second Battle of Roncheveau in 824. Thanks to this he became the undisputed ruler of Pamplona, thus establishing the Kingdom of Pamplona, later known as Navarre. Despite this period being often characterized by Asturias and Cordoba fighting each other, the two would also make peace at times and deal with their own internal problems or deal with outside threats like Vikings, because you know this is the Viking Age. Though by 868 Asturias managed to conquer the city of Porto and created the county of Portugal. Though the Kingdom of Asturias wouldn't last forever because by around 910 and 925 after a messy succession Asturias capital was moved to the city of Leon and the kingdom was divided with Asturias transitioning to become the Kingdom of Leon and Galicia gaining its independence. And a few years later the county of Castile became powerful enough to essentially act independently from Leon and became an autonomous county. These three states would sporadically unite and separate multiple times and to be honest keeping up with it is more trouble than it's worth. Remember how I mentioned that Cordoba had political ambitions in North Africa? Well since 909 North Africa was dominated by the Fatimid Caliphate who rivaled Cordoba in asserting control in the western Maghreb. Unlike the Emirate, the Fatimids didn't recognize their Abbasids as the rightful caliphs and claimed the caliphate for themselves. So in response, Al Rahman III declared himself of Caliph, elevating Cordoba to become the Caliphate of Cordoba. So by the year 1000, Iberia looked like this. It would be during the Caliphate that Cordoba would reach its peak in both cultural and economical prosperity, but it would also shortly thereafter collapse, while the Christian kingdoms would continue to expand, not just in Iberia, but also to the rest of Europe. But that's a story for another time. 